Hello, I'm Christian Jenko, and here is my update for November-ish of 2020. Let's get started. There's really two main categories today. We're going to talk about business, and then we're going to talk about health. Uh, oh, Talon is on. Hold on one second. I might cut that out. I might not. <laughs> this is just my monthly update. Low, uh, low effort. Uh, let's talk about business first. I took Ali Abdel's part-time YouTuber class. It was the best class I've ever taken through high school and college in terms of the way that it was organized and the clarity of the information and the usefulness of the information and the support structures around it of the peer mentorship and the workshops and the homework assignment. It was incredible. And getting to learn from Ali Abdel, one of the best YouTubers that's ever existed, what an amazing experience. What a fantastic way to spend money. If I could continue doing that, if... if if I can keep pumping money into things like this, and I have, I think, two or three more opportunities of ways to do this. There's a writing course I'd like to take. Uh, Dave, David Pirel's uh, Art of Writing and probably Marie Poulin's Notion Mastery, even though I hate Notion, uh, would be very interesting to take. Hiring experts who are humans, I think, is one of the most effective ways to exchange money for a better life. Whoa, <laughs> uh, that changed uh, rapidly. There's several interesting things I learned about the course. Oh, this was really cool. This is a assessment of the areas where the course wants to improve your ability to be a YouTuber. You get this very detailed questionnaire. Here's all my, oops, here's all my detailed answers right here. And then scored me based on each of those. And then after the course, I get to take another one and see how I improved. So interesting seeing the links of this course, which is YouTubers, people wanting to principally be able to reach more people and to be uh, going content first, thinking about communication first, thinking about building an audience first, comparing that sort of business and the advice given for how to build that business to the microconf community, which is very intrinsically product first. The people in that audience are usually developers or usually uh, coaches, pe people who start with the value, start with, okay, I've built a valuable thing. How do I get people to learn more about that? And the YouTubers are coming from the opposite end of, I'm starting this platform where a bunch of people are going to hear about me so that I can just consistently make videos and people watch them. And then one of the lessons was on, okay, well, how do you monetize that? How do you make something valuable where you'll, you'll actually make money? So combining those two just feels like this powerhouse of, okay, now I can build useful things and I know how all of that works and how software as a service works. And I have this whole skill set of here's generically how to make easily digestible content that's broadly applicable from YouTube. Connecting those two just seems like a powerhouse. I'll, I'll give a small example of the... Oh, I'm, I'm going to mistake the units. There's there's a unit of, uh, I think it's CPMs, uh, uh, cost per mil, where mil means a thousand. Uh, that's the amount of money that you make per thousand people that watch your video. And for Ali Abdel's channel, he has over a million subscribers. For a video, so YouTube will pay him about $2 per CPM. So if a thousand people watch his video he'll make $2 and it scales up from there. So at his scale of, he has a million subscribers, that becomes a lot of money. That becomes, I think it's in the tens of thousands of dollars per month, uh, which is insane. That's so much money. Comparing that though with, if you have a product and you charge $50 a month for that product and you get a hundred people to watch it, or you get a thousand people to watch a video about that and 1% of them convert. So 1% of a thousand is 10, 10 people at $50 a month is now making you $500 a month compared to $2. It, it, it seems insane. It seems like combining these two skill sets is, is just going to be incredible. And I feel like this YouTuber skill set is a thing that I've been looking for. Of a, I, I sort of pathologically just build stuff and love building useful things. And uh, I have been searching for methods of marketing that don't feel distasteful to me, that feel like, oh, this is a cool way that I can be sharing more stuff that I'm making. And this course feels like it was aimed directly at that, of here is the generic skill set of how you can more effectively tell people about your stuff. 
Uh, more stuff is coming about this course. If you visit my blog posts, uh, I've, I have like my homework assignments for this video. Uh, there's a sleep mask I think you should get. It's called the Mantis Sleep Mask. It'll make you sleep better. I got a jazzy little video about it. Uh, next, the podcast that I started with my friend Chris Atchard, makers.dev, is going so well. And I love it. I, I really enjoy making them. I really enjoy recording them. I enjoy uh, chatting with Chris. It feels like a very good check-in once a week to keep me on track with my higher level goals. It's been so worthwhile, even if no one watches. And there's, there's like two people that are that are regulars. Uh, someone named Qubit? I'm, I'm actually not sure who that is, but has like commented on every video and it's, it's so much fun. But I, I would be making these even if they were private videos because it's useful for me to go back and see the things that I was thinking about in my work. So if you're enjoying these monthly updates, if you like this video, you can watch way too much content from me. It's about 40 minutes per week of the specific thing. This is just a terrible thumbnail. Uh, what What is my hair? Uh, every week going through and, and giving an update. Uh, this was all just in the last month. It's amazing. Do, doing something once a week stacks up surprisingly quickly. Uh, so I've, I've very much enjoyed those. I don't know what that's going to become, but it's, it's a fun experiment in this sort of long form content. Um, if you're interested in how I and Chris run our bootstrap businesses, you can check us out. It's great. Along these same lines, I've been wanting for so long to be capturing more of the value in one-on-one -on -one conversations that I have. This is sort of in this general philosophy of, I would like the things that I'm doing to be more scalable. So instead of having a one-on-one -on -one conversation, I would love if that was syndicated more and uh, the, the ideas that I was having were shared more. That's part of the reason why I'm doing these monthly updates is I have so many friends who have, I've had conversations with who say something along the lines of, uh, I, I feel like I'm keeping in such better touch with you and I love your monthly updates and we can launch right into a conversation about, ah, they know the things that I've been thinking about and they have comments on it so we can jump right into that. There's, there's much less of the friction of... Uh, talking to each other just to catch each other up. If someone's watching these videos and you can watch them at multiple times speed or like on a train or a bus, you don't have to carve out time to do it. We can sort of skip past that and, and dive deep into, okay, let's talk about the philosophy of why we're doing this or uh, go more personally into here's our shared history and let's link back the things that we're thinking with things that we've thought before on this topic. So along those lines, I've started recording the conversations that I've, I'm having so far. So far, I've only done it with my friend Shai, uh, who is a co-founder of a company called Write Message. Super cool guy, uh, based out the out of the UK. And our conversations have been so interesting. It's it's going into these topics of like philosophy and stoicism and happiness. And there's this type of conversation that I engage in that I've only ever felt this feeling with a, a handful of people, maybe less than a half a dozen, where in the midst of the conversation, I feel sort of transcendent of my brain just feels like it's it's lighter and exploding and uh, the it, it feels so honest and open and uh, we're, we're, it's this give and take in this game of exploring these new places. And uh, it doesn't feel like either of us are pursuing an agenda. It doesn't feel like we're hiding something or uh, talking shamefully. We're just, we're just honestly chatting and trying to further discover the truth. I love these conversations. I'm investing a disproportionate amount of energy in them of like time coding them and editing them. Uh, but there's, there's something about that that uh, we'll talk about next. Uh, so I, I love it. If, if we have had a conversation and you found it interesting, you may enjoy listening to conversations that I've had with other people. And also, and this brings us to our next point. If you go through and watch the eight videos that I posted here, probably more than eight hours of content, uh, that's insane. <laughs> I, I don't expect any reasonable person to, to do that. The reason is it takes commitment to watch a 40 minute video. That's a long time. You gotta schedule that in your day. The content strategy that I've seen that I think makes the most sense is the sort of thing that uh, Gary Vaynerchuk and uh, Joe Rogan do where they take a long form piece of content and they split it up into tiny pieces and then they syndicate that across all their social media networks. This is a machine that I'm building. And I think if I was optimizing for getting this done as quickly as possible, I would hire a social media team. This is something I'm gonna experiment with next month. And ultimately, uh, I'm coming to understand my personality much better of 
the most fulfilling way and the most effective way for me to build this sort of system is just to completely automate it, to use computers over humans. So I'm putting together this pipeline where the dream is the marginal work for me personally in recording an interview and getting it published and syndicating it out of clips and doing the time coding and titling it and getting it where it needs to be. I would love for that, the amount of time that I'm spending on that to only be the amount of time that I spend in the actual conversation. So like scheduling the conversation happens automatically in a system. I sit down uh, when my calendar tells me to, and I have my notes already written there of what we're going to talk about. I sit down, we record it. Uh, I hit stop. That video gets automatically edited. There's this editing system I really like of this three camera angle where it's just me, both of us, and just the person I'm talking to. And then if just I'm talking, it, it's full screen me. And then the other person starts talking, it's both of us for three seconds and then switches to them and goes back and forth like that. Ideally, that would happen automatically. Uh, and I did it. I built a machine that can edit videos like that. Uh, and a web platform I'm using called Riverside for editing those videos reached out to me after they saw a tweet that I had automated that editing system. And they're going to roll that into their platform, which I'm so excited about. They're going to, they're going to maintain my code for me. It feels like I have employees for free. Um, and after that, so that the video has been uh, edited, uh, interesting parts of it need to be highlighted. I think I'm going to need a human to do this. Of like, watch the video, title it, uh, add interesting snapshots. And I foresee me doing that for a long time because that's... Uh, sort of creative writing work. Uh, I'm, I'm definitely not opposed to, to another person doing it, but I want to sit to my size that more. And then from that, once it's chaptered, uh, the next stage in the pipeline would be extract interesting clips from it and then uh, format those in a way that works for social media. So most social media platforms want the video to be square. 80% uh, of people... <laughs> that's the number thrown around. I don't actually have a justification for that. 80% uh, of people usually browse social media with their volume turned off. So uh, subtitling the clip makes it much more effective, makes it, makes it much more engaging. So next stage in the process is you subtitle it, uh, burn those in, and then queue those up on different social media networks. So I'm thinking for every social media platform I have, I would love to be posting at least one piece of content per day that's a little clip from either these videos or some of the conversations that I'm having or the podcast or a tutorial that I've made. Uh, and it's scheduled out, so it's it's only once a day. I, I would love to be batching this so that if there's a human doing it, uh, they can just do it all in one go, and then the, the next two weeks of content are scheduled out. This is a machine that I'm building. I'm, I think it's going to be slow getting there, uh, and that's my dream of content. I think along the lines of seeing what, seeing what Ali Abdal's channel and workflow of content looks like. I think that's the machine that I want to build. Uh, there's a new category of content that I'd like to be focusing more on of related to the video I made about sleep masks. This, uh, not just conversations, but like deeper topics and essays that I've written. And I think my workflow for that is going to look like I write an article about it. I tweet that article and I post it on Facebook and I get feedback from that. And then after I've iterated through that and worked with the text because text is easier to update, then I record a video about it, then the video gets published, then I syndicate that on different networks. Uh, so that's what I'm thinking there. Oh, small note, I updated my website. I <laughs> uh, had a very manic work week last week. Uh, I, I don't think I am bipolar. I don't think I have hypomania, but I definitely noticed there are swings in my energy. Last week was a very uh, high energy week where I was just jumping around all kinds of different projects and getting stuff done. One of the things I did was redo my blog. You can see I have this very nice font and it's nice colors and it responds to uh, dark mode on your computer. And oh, yeah, perfect little curved borders. I love it. Uh, I rewrote a blog engine to do. <laughs> I didn't rewrite it. I, I wrote my own blog engine from scratch that takes in Markdown files and renders this. Oh, I'm so proud of it. It's it feels like a much closer reflection of me than what I had before. This is a weird one that's under business. I did the first jigsaw puzzle last month that I've done in years. It was so much fun. But it was fun in a very work-intensive way of... I, I found myself drawing all these analogies to business of the difficulties in business are that it's foggy and you're not quite sure what to do next. And you start a strategy and it works for a little while, but then it stops. And 
you you need to s be able to switch the level of abstraction from high level to low level of focusing on the, the tiniest little detail of the little sliver of color to this overall picture of, okay, well, uh, the pattern being here means that it probably fits within this and that fits within this. Uh, there are tactics that work and strategies, but sometimes it makes sense to, to not go on the tactic. So uh, I, I feel like I've updated my framework of just how to successfully navigate the world uh, by, by doing this puzzle, which seems a little, a little dramatic, but... Uh, I really enjoyed this puzzle, <laughs> and uh, I am now viewing the world in a different way because of it. Uh, all right, that, that was all business stuff. Let's talk about health. This was a momentous month for health. I had my first elective surgery. I don't know why I said elective. Yeah, my first surgery. I had four of my teeth pulled. The, I, have, I have four fewer teeth than in the last monthly update. Had all my wisdom teeth taken out. And this came in a development of thinking much more consciously about my dental health. And I feel like I was telling myself these stories of that I don't need to be concerned about my dental health, that it's fine. I don't need to go to a dentist. I hadn't been to a dentist in about 10 years as of, uh, I think about two years ago. And... I noticed in the mirror one day that I had these black spots on my molars in the back. And I thought, oh, well, it might be staining, but uh, I don't know. I guess we'll check it out. Very hard for me to establish this new pattern of going to a dentist. Felt super anxious. Uh, was Googling all around for like who the best dentist was and ended up going to a place. And they said, oh, yes, you have cavities. But much more importantly, you have periodontitis. Periodontitis, if you don't know, is when plaque buildup, plaque is just uh, bacteria that sticks to your teeth, plaque buildup grows below the gum. That's a problem because now the plaque can be separating your teeth from your gums, and if left untreated, your teeth will just fall out. It's it's bad. Uh, <laughs> the fix for that is you take this water pick and shove it between your gum line and your teeth and just blast the, the plaque away, uh, and then your gums can heal and reform to your teeth. So I had that done. Uh, that was about two years ago. And since then, I've just been methodically flossing and, and thinking much more consciously about dental health. Uh, and health in general, but uh, dental health in particular. Something that they told me two years ago, that they've told me every single time since I've gone to the dentist, is that I should get my wisdom teeth out. I had a similar narrative of like, ah, I don't need to get my wisdom teeth out, it's been fine. Uh, haven't experienced much pain, it's, it's not a problem that I need to deal with. And while I was in Ohio, my friend Luke told me this practice that he goes through of asking himself, what the work that he least wants to do in that day is. And inevitably, it points him towards the most important work he can be doing. And in doing this daily practice, one day I woke up and saw the question pop up on my to-do list. Uh, what's the work that you least want to do today? And the answer popped into my mind of research wisdom teeth removal. If I'm not going to do it, I want to be definitive and decisive of like, okay, here, here are the reasons why I don't want to do it. And so I Googled a bunch and was able to find evidence on both sides. Of, uh, I, I feel like I could have made the choice either way and perfectly justified it. Uh, if I'm looking for evidence to support that I shouldn't get my wisdom teeth taken out, I can find it. And I can, I can give you just the most ironclad argument that I, that I uh, should not get them taken out. And the consensus among professionals of like the dentist that I'd gone to that hadn't led me astray, they cured my periodontitis, and two of my uncles who were dentists, was to get them taken out. That's a significant risk. Getting surgery of any kind is uh, very risky. There's risk of infection. The whole process of taking antibiotics is harmful to your gut bacteria and normal flora. Uh, there are surgical complications that can happen, specifically with wisdom teeth. You can get dry socket. You can just start bleeding uncontrollably and then die. Uh, you can get nerve damage. When the teeth are pulled, it can make a hole in your nasal cavity, and that can be a whole thing. And... It seemed to be in my long-term best interest to just get this dealt with and taken care of because there are so many things that can happen. My, my teeth were effectively rotting from inside my mouth. Uh, all sorts of plaque and decay and the two bottom ones were impacted. Uh, one was partially erupted. There's a whole bunch of different infection things that can happen with that. The, the, the impacted teeth can start growing and uh, damage the, the, the tooth that's, that's there. I felt so anxious about this process, so many unknowns, so many things that I just felt terrified about. And 
I am so proud of myself that I was able to work through that and make the long-term decision. This is an idea that I'm going to talk about a little bit later. I was able to very rationally prepare for the surgery. I read a whole bunch of things about it. I uh, watched some terrifying videos about wisdom teeth getting removed. I talked about that in the last video. I uh, prepared by getting all the things I needed. I had soup ready and I had, oh, just the, the most wonderful thing. It's this, these hot cold packs that wrap around your face. It was invaluable, the, the single best purchase I made in the, in the entire process. And the day of the surgery, I went there and a specific thing happened that uh, stuck out of my mind because I know that if I was in a different mental state, it would have just shaken me. Uh, I was there with my sister, Sophia. Sophia and I walk in, the waiting room's full of people. And there's a woman there sort of scrambling around taking people's temperatures. And she took three or four people's temperatures that I saw and then came to the front desk where Sophia and I were standing and told the receptionist, hey, this is broken. It needs a new battery because the numbers are wrong. And the receptionist said, what? No, you're just not holding it close enough. I, Hold on, let me see it. And looked at it and said, oh, the temperature is in Celsius. And in the moment, I thought that was amusing. And I know that if I was in a worse mental state, I would have spiraled in that moment thinking, oh my God, everyone in this office is incompetent. What have I done? I've chosen the wrong place. Should I even get my wisdom teeth taken out? But in the moment, I, I was in a very good spot of, I, I was feeling fearful because there was this big unknown if I was about to get a bunch of drugs pumped in me. Uh, benzodiazepine, by the way. Oh boy, I, that's, that's, a, that's a drug. Uh, and... I stayed perfectly calm and was joking with Sophia and afterwards was uh, very personable with the people that were there. I uh, had them laughing and uh, the, the woman even who had made the mistake, I found out she is someone who works in marketing for the company and they just pulled her in to help because they had a huge wave of it. So like, that was perfectly fine. The surgery went great. The My my oral surgeon was uh, very competent. I was in and out and like, uh, or not in and out. I the, the entire surgery lasted about eight minutes. Uh, had almost no complications. I have one very gross exception that happened on day seven. Uh, I should be irrigating. Uh, I'm never going to have this done again. If you get your wisdom teeth taken out, uh, irrigate your dirty mouth holes before day seven. Uh, do it very gently. It was disgusting. It was it felt like a fish tank in my mouth. Oh, it, it was awful. I hated it. Um, <laughs> the, uh, bigger point here being, this is a, a fantastic example for me of Something that was very difficult for me to do that is in was in my long-term benefit uh, that I, I would like to be making more of this type of choice. I'm jumping around a little bit here, but th there are several examples like this that happened last month of uh, advice that I got from a dating coach was to focus on the long-term game of uh, do the inner work as opposed to doing more super superficial things like, you know, learning uh, dating hacks or getting a photo shoot or something. Uh, the the long-term work always pays off. Uh, in business, there's a concept that Ali Abdal talked about in his course, referencing Gary Vaynerchuk's jab, 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 right hook strategy of you want to delay gratification as long as possible. Uh, you, you want to offer free content as much as you possibly can before you ask for a sale. In comedy, there's a very similar concept of you want to build up pressure uh, and just keep building pressure. And the longer you build up pressure before the punchline, before you release it, the funnier the punchline will be. Uh, the, the more you can heighten it, the, the the further you'll fall then, and falling is good in this context, or it, it's a funnier joke. I'd like to be doing that more. I'd, I'd like to be really consciously thinking about choices that I make that are short-term focused. Uh, if, I, if I eat a piece of candy, uh, that's very short-term focused. Uh, what would it look like if I was maximizing the amount of long-term choices that I could possibly make, that I had the capacity to make? Uh, that's an idea I'm chewing on. Uh, there was one more thought here. Uh, oh, it was interesting getting knocked back down to the lower levels of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, of really needing to consciously think about things like food and water and sleep. Those all became challenging for me for the first week after the surgery. Uh, just like making sure that I was 
eating and sleeping and drinking water and taking my drugs on time like that that was my capacity that's what i was able to do i have much more sympathy now for uh people who are struggling with chronic conditions uh it it just handicapped my ability to do anything and I, I felt very frustrated for the first few days of i was sympathetic with myself knowing that you know i, I pre-planned what to expect I, I knew probably what i would be capable of um and probably, you know, around day 10, I started feeling very frustrated of like, okay, I'm, I'm done with this. I would like to be recovering faster. Uh, this, this is becoming inconvenient. Um, and it's helped me appreciate so much more. Uh, right now in this moment, I feel no pain. I, uh, all of my body is fully functioning. Uh, what, a, what an incredibly fortunate experience this is to have. Uh, how could I possibly complain about anything when, when I, uh, I have this bountiful experience just as a baseline? Uh, it's amazing and easy to take for granted because it just becomes the new normal. Related to this, one of the breakthroughs that I had with my therapist was focusing on the positive aspects of things and people and experiences. Uh, this, this came up specifically with my father. I, I was sort of spiraling in these negative thoughts of projecting onto him the person who I wanted him to be as opposed to uh, accepting him for who he was and feeling thankful that, you know, my dad's a, a fantastic person. He started his own business. He's incredibly industrious. He's incredibly intelligent. Uh, I, I owe him a lot. I love him. And it in, in certain mental frames, it becomes easy for me to focus on the things that he is not that I want him to be. So related to this, so that, that's sort of where the idea started. Uh, I started noticing that I would wake up on some days and just feel bad. Something had happened. I, I hadn't slept well or uh, I would be clumsy in the morning and uh, like uh, injure my finger. Uh, oh, will that, will that focus? Let's do that. Oh, no, because I have autofocus turned off. Just kidding. Uh, the, or, you know, I would, I would almost get into a car accident and then be feeling anxious about that. And I think my, my normal mode of acting in that sort of situation would be uh, writing off the day as like, oh, well, I can't do that because today's a bad day because this bad thing happened. And I've shifted from that mentality to thinking about strategies I can use to improve a day instead of, uh, you know, uh, step number one was sort of noticing that, that the day was going downward. Uh, and the next step is learning tactics that consistently can move the trajectory back up. So for me, that's things like taking a nap. If I'm feeling bad, oh, taking a nap is so effective or going climbing or going for a walk or uh, engaging in some deep, meaningful, creative work. That feels like a much more useful process than uh, blaming a bad day on some external characteristic. Yes, bad things will happen. And it's so much more useful to uh, be able to recognize that the thing that I have control over is uh, how to improve it. I'm, I'm, I'm in control of the direction that I'm moving, not the position that I happen to be at at any point in time. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm recording this right now on my brand new uh, Apple Silicon MacBook Pro 13 inch. It's amazing, it's so fast. I went through an experience Earlier this month, after I ordered, I, I was probably one of the first people in the world to, to order this. As soon as the Apple keynote was done, I was on their website, just like frantically refreshing it. And then as soon as it was ready, I, I ordered it and, and got it in. And I was ordering it around Thanksgiving. Three, two, one. I was thinking I'm gonna be in St. Louis when this is ordered for Thanksgiving. So I should ship it straight to St. Louis. And then it shipped early. So like, great, fantastic. I, I have this brand new laptop coming in and it's shipping early. Uh, this is wonderful. And the agony that I went through <laughs> of trying to figure out how I could get this laptop just a few days earlier. I was thinking like, do I drive out there on my own a few days earlier or do I fly out or do I uh, ask my cousin who I shipped it to, to to overnight FedEx it to me or do I try to intercept the package and, and ship it to myself? It was such a negative experience that stemmed from this incredibly positive thing. 
and it has me thinking now about the, there's Buddhist ideas that I'm not super familiar with about this of like that, that suffering uh, is rooted in wanting the world to be different than how it is. And that can happen positively or negatively. Either the, the desire for a positive thing or the, the lamenting of a negative thing uh, that has happened or, or anxiety that it's going to happen in either way. So I have this as a touchstone now of uh, I would like to make decisions in the future to be choosing to experience things positively. Uh, Especially if they're positive things, but even if they're negative things. That, that, that's not a, a thought that's super uh, condensed. Related to Thanksgiving, I enjoyed so much just hanging out with my siblings. And it has me revitalized in thinking about eventually wanting to live communally. I think that's how humans are supposed to be living. And it's just so nice being in a group of people who you love and care about and having the support and uh, if you ever want to do th something or uh, do something in a group, th there's just always people around. The, one of my favorite living experiments so far has been living in a dorm uh, in college and being able to just walk down the hall and anything you wanted to do. If you want to play a board game, if you want to go have an outing, if you want to go play uh, tag in the, in the quad or something, you just walk down the hall and you, you find people who will do it. So I have this dream of some sort of a communal living arrangement. I'm not. I'm not quite sure what this is going to look like. My friend Brian Richards sort of has this. He, he him, and uh, several members of his family all live in the same neighborhood. He described to me the situation of he when him and his wife went on vacation. They just told the kids, "All right, go to your grandparents' house," and they just walked two houses down and were at their grandparents' house, and uh, it was just zero friction. I would like to set up that environment before I have kids. Uh, Long-term thinking is a idea that I already touched on. Uh, wow, this video was longer than I intended. Uh, I, I guess that's it. <laughs> I hope you had a good November-ish and I hope you have a great December-ish. Hey, 2020 is almost over. Uh, you did it. Have a great December and goodbye. See you next month.